listening to the John Barrett Leadership Podcast, where you'll hear great ideas, insight, and inspiration to level up your leadership ability. Hey guys, it's John Barrett with the John Barrett Leadership Podcast. Once again, so glad you are tuning in and being a part of this. We want to help level you up so you don't level out in your leadership, in your influence, in your impact. So I'm so glad that you're listening today. Hey, listen, if you're new to the podcast, go back and check out some of the previous episodes and uh, make sure that you download a leader guide at johnbarrettleadership.com. You can go check out the podcast uh, there and you can download the leader guide for each episode that has some fill in the blanks and some of the content that we cover uh, in this episode and in each episode that we do. Also, I'd love for you to leave me a review wherever you listen to this at. Uh, it's super helpful to know that uh, people are listening and getting value from it. And as others search for it, it really helps to validate the podcast. So thanks so much for doing that. Hey, listen, we want to jump into today's episode of Leading with Questions. That's right, Leading with Questions. One of the most powerful things that a leader has is questions. The ability to be a good question asker and uh, the ability to be able to lead with questions and not just answers. Now, this is a whole different kind of model of leadership, and it's one of the most effective forms of leadership. In fact, I would argue that you can't be an effective leader unless you know how to ask good questions. And if a, you're a good leader, leaders tend to ask more questions than they answer. But it's a whole different style, and we'll get into that later, but most leaders lead with answers, not questions. We've been told all throughout life to lead with answers. Uh, Leaders are ones that should always have something to say, should always have a strategy, should always know the right words at the right time, and all these kind of things. But the reality is, is that there's a different model of leadership that is so much more effective, and when you get it. When you uncover this thing, you begin to lead at a whole new level and it impacts those around you in a whole new way. So let's kind of jump into today's topic and let me unpack some ideas for you that I think are really going to help. Now, Socrates taught that the quality of the questions we ask will determine the quality of life we live. Think about that for a minute. What a powerful statement. The quality of the questions we ask will determine the quality of life that we live. And I think in leadership, the quality of the questions you ask as a leader will determine the quality of your leadership. I mean, it is a direct result. Asking questions will take you further than answering them. So you show me someone who's good at asking questions, and I'll show you someone who's going to be successful in the future. It's a fact. It always comes with it. In fact, the, the, the prerequisite, if you will, of being a great leader is knowing how to ask really great questions. So the greatest leaders are the ones who lead with questions. In fact, great leaders spend more time asking questions than they do providing answers. You know, I've got a good friend, Bob Teed, who's a leadership author. He's got a great uh, website. He's written several books uh, about leading with questions, and he he really just hones in on that one kind of idea. But I love what uh, what author Bob Teed said. He said that leadership is not as much about knowing the right answers as it is about knowing the right questions. And I think, wow, what a what a great idea. We spend so much time trying to get the answers. And, and, and trying to have something to say, but really great leaders spend more time developing the quality of their questions. You know, over the years, we've been led to believe that leaders are those who walk boldly and they accumulate power and they bark out orders and they make decisions for everybody to carry out. And the more they're in the know, the better of a leader they are. But that simply isn't the case, or at least it's not the case anymore. I mean, it may have worked at one point in time uh, in, the, in the history, in the past, where leaders were that way, but today's leader is a whole different type of leader. It's one who asks great questions. They listen carefully. They strategize collaboratively, and they build consensus among all those necessary for achieving results. It means that they work as a team. You know, Woodrow Wilson said that the ear of the leader must ring with the voices of the people. I think that's so good. The ear of the leader must ring with the voices of the people. 
you know, I, I don't want to jump on politics or anything like that. That's not what this podcast is about. But I'll tell you what, in our in the U.S. here, you know, our political system, those that we have uh, um, voted to put into power at every level from uh, local to, to government, federal level and all that, um, you know, there's a real shift that's happened. You know, it used to be that our politicians were, were a voice for the people. But now, for whatever reason, I mean, I think government's just kind of gotten a little bit out of control for whatever reason. But, but it's almost like they are the voice to the people now. Instead of representing what the people want, they they just kind of make orders and they're just kind of taking control of things uh, regardless of, of what the society may need. And again, I, I don't mean that to be a controversial political statement. I'm just saying that over time, what happens is is that is, is these sort of political figures, not all of them, by no means all of them, but but many political figures from local to federal level, um, they're, they're not listening to the people anymore and trying to be a voice of representation. They are trying to shape what the people want. They are trying to almost dictate in some ways uh, what the people are going to do. And so it's just kind of a crazy thing uh, that our nation is in. But that's the temptation of leadership. I mean, when you start to get power and you start to, to kind of rise up and level up in your leadership, I'm telling you, there is a temptation that you've got to have answers and that you need to tell people what to do rather than then listen. And that's why I love that, that quote by Woodrow Wilson that said, the ear of the leader must ring with the voices of the people. You know, I, I've always heard this statement that, remember this, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason, to listen twice as much as we talk. Uh, that's good, right? I mean, you've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. It's, it's a sign to you as a leader that you've got to listen twice as much as you talk. Because listening and being able to ask great questions creates a feedback loop that equips us as leaders to make proper assessments and decisions. You know, assuming that you know without truly knowing can cause false assessments that produce false results. So you've got to understand that, that you may not know everything as a leader. You don't always have to have the answer. In fact, again, leading with questions is more effective. Great leaders lead by listening to what others are communicating. They engage them. They get them involved in it. You know, a great leader spends the majority of their time asking rather than telling. I mean, think about that for a minute. They ask rather than tell. They engage the other person. You know, I, I, I um, learned this early on in, in, in my leadership kind of career, if you will. I'll never forget, I was invited out to Southern California to a conference to be one of the guest speakers. Uh, I wasn't the keynote speaker or anything like that. It was just kind of a new opportunity. I was kind of more of a breakout kind of side stage speaker, if you will. But it was a great opportunity for me. And I'll never forget flying out there and, and getting checked into the hotel. And when I was getting checked into the hotel, um, the, 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 during the day, the conference started that night. Uh, I met one of the, the keynote speakers. Now, he was there, and, and we met. I, I, I knew of him, uh, but I, did, I had never met him. He was you know, pretty big in this circle and uh, had, a, had a great voice of, of leadership and influence. And um, we met in the lobby, and we introduced ourselves and all that. And you know, it, was, it was a great connection. He was a great guy. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. Got to meet the keynote speaker. He's kind of a famous in my circle, if you will. You know? And... Uh, that night he spoke, and I mean, he was phenomenal. I mean, he hit it out of the park. I mean, it was incredible. I just remember thinking, wow, I know this guy. And uh, and so what was cool, when we got back to the hotel, um, we kind of met up and that, and you know, I said, hey, great job, and that was phenomenal tonight. And he said, yeah. He said, hey, listen, why don't we have some breakfast in the morning? Uh, you know, just kind of, you know, introduce ourselves and kind of see what each other's doing and all that. And I thought, wow, man, this guy's inviting me to breakfast. This is great. So I was pretty jazzed up, went to bed that night and, you know, pretty excited. And uh, next morning, got up, got ready, met him down for breakfast uh, down there at the restaurant. And uh, I'll never forget, we sat down and here I am thinking, wow, this guy is a seasoned leader. Uh, he's got so much going for him. Um, you know, just a phenomenal guy. I've got so much to learn from this guy. So I actually came kind of prepared with some questions to ask him and kind of learn from him. And I'll never forget it. As soon as we sat down, he just jumped in. And he just started asking me questions about leadership and what my thoughts were about this and that and delegation and authority and influence. And I mean, he was picking my brain 
And I can remember just sitting there after a, the first, you know, three or four questions thinking, what is going on? I mean, this guy's a seasoned leader. I've got nothing to teach this guy. I mean, he's way beyond, you know, older than me and had so much more experience. I mean, he, he's an expert in this. And here I am, this young pup, you know, <laughs> teaching and learning leadership and all that. And he just kept asking me question after question. And I, that whole time, I almost never got to any of my questions because he was just so engaging. And I'll never forget, not only was he just asking me questions, he would validate some of my statements. He'd look and he'd say, oh, John, that's a, that was a great idea. I love that, what you just said, or that quote that you just said, or that thought, or that principle. You know, you put a fresh spin on that. I really like that. Um, and he was taking notes Right. So get this picture right here. I am just thinking, what is going on? It was like the roles were reversed. Like here I am, uh, you know, feeling like a celebrity or something. And, and, and here he is, you know, doing this incredible thing. So, you know, I, I, I just I'll never forget that. And it made such an impact on me as a young leader. And I thought, you know what? That's the kind of leader I want to be. Because I want to be engaging. I want to connect with people. I always want to be a learner and, and engage. And you know what it did? This is so crazy. So even though he was the seasoned leader that had all the answers and I should have been asking the questions, because he was so engaging with me and learning and listening and validated me, guess what? It made me like him all the more. I mean, I, I got to the point where I thought I, I would go work for this guy for free just to be around him. I mean, he was so encouraging, so engaging, and, and, and just made me feel like a million dollars. And I thought, man, I would work for this guy for free. So I'm telling you, when you lead with questions and you engage with people, I'm telling you, it, it creates influence with them. And not only that, but you develop then. Listen, I learned a lot as I was speaking and, and answering his questions, I'm telling you, I walked away from that and I learned some things because he engaged me so well and got me to think so hard about these leadership questions, these great questions that he was asking that I actually learned some things about myself and I actually put into words some things as I processed them as he engaged me. So I just want you to know that it's such a powerful uh, thing to be able to do this. It reminds me of this. You know, Benjamin Drizelli and William Gladstone, they, they were two of the most politically competitive rivals in the 19th century in Great Britain. And, and I mean, the battles between them were so intense in the political arena. I mean, it flowed over to their personal lives, which is a whole other story. But, I mean, it was, it was like the pinnacle of, of a fight, a political fight for these two. And they were both very animated people, and, and they were experts in, in, in politics. And still, Benjamin Drizelli beat Gladstone, and he became the victor as prime minister in the end. But what separated these two rivals, here's what's so interesting, is that Drizelli's ability to connect with others, that's what really set him apart. That's really why he won. And the difference is best illustrated by the account of this young woman who dined with both of them on consecutive nights. She was an interviewer and journalist. And when she was asked about her impression of the rival William Gladstone at the time, she said, when I left Gladstone, when I left the dining room after sitting next to Mr. Gladstone, I thought he was the cleverest man in England. But she said this, she said, but after sitting next to Mr. Drizelli, I thought I was the cleverest woman in England. And I'm telling you, this ability that Benjamin Drizelli had to be able to connect with people. You know, Gladstone, in that sort of encounter, focused on himself and, and just answers and trying to impress and all these kind of things. But when, when this lady sat down with Mr. Drizelli, she said, you know what? I thought I was the cleverest woman in England. I mean, he made me feel great about myself. And that's what a great leader does, not just making somebody feel great about themselves, but they develop people by asking questions. It's so incredible. Now, think about this thing. When you engage your team and those around you with questions, it, it allows them to think. It allows them to develop. And see, you will never improve those around you if you're solving all their problems for them. You'll never develop them. And what questions do, they help develop somebody. Answers don't develop people. They just direct people. And there's a big difference as a leader between directing and developing people. 
Most leaders are spending their time directing, and as a result, they're not getting much out of it. And it creates a codependent relationship where you have to be there in order to direct. You have to be there to give the answers because if you're not there with the answer, nobody knows what to do. But great leaders that lead with questions, they develop their people. And that, that development causes them to be able to think for themselves and solve problems by themselves and step up to the plate and even level up themselves so that you as the leader don't have to create a codependent relationship that is dependent upon you being present. You see, one of the greatest uh, um, indicators is if you're leading well is what happens when you're not around. I mean, when you leave the office or you leave the project, does it still go on? Or is it all dependent on you? If you are needed in your organization at every moment and every turn, then you've created a codependent relationship where you're probably directing more than you are developing. And I'm telling you, it is not sustainable and it's not scalable. You can't create a system that is dependent upon you always being there with an answer. It will not be sustainable, number one, for you, and it will not be scalable, number two, to be able to grow without you. And so you have got to take on more of a developmental type leadership style. And how do you do that? You lead with questions. Listen, questions educate and develop. In fact, do you know that the word educate actually comes from the Latin word educo? And it means to draw out from within. So when you teach somebody and you develop them and you educate them, Giving them the answer doesn't educate them because at the very heart of education is this word aduco that means to draw out from within. So you have to get the other person to come up with the answer. If you just tell them what the answer is, you haven't developed them. Now think about it in school. I mean, if if you're in a classroom and you're a teacher and you're trying to teach elementary kids about math and you say, okay, well, two plus two is four. Everybody memorize that. Got it? Four, four, four. Got it? That's the answer. Are you really educating them? I mean, just by telling them to memorize and and direct them on an answer? No, they have to know how they got to four, right? So when little Johnny, so to speak, sits down in your class and you're talking with uh, with him, you may say, well, Johnny, what is two plus two? And and he may look at you and think, well, I, I don't know. What is it, teacher? And you're tempted just to tell him the answer. Well, it's four. Just go ahead and get it. No, no, no. You've got to slow down and say, well, what do you think it is, Johnny? And Johnny says, well, I don't know, two plus two, I mean, I, five? And, and instead of saying, no, Johnny, it, it's not five, it's four. Get the answer, it's four. You still have to slow down. You say, well, Johnny, how did you come up with five? Well, I was thinking about your apple analogy. I had two apples here, two apples here, and then when I put them together, one, two, three, four. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is, it, is it four, teacher? And again, right now, you, your, your response is not necessarily just to say, yes, that's the answer, it's four, memorize that. You say, well, Johnny, do you think it's four? Is that what you think? Is that your, is that your final decision, right? And then you let them step out in confidence or boldness or whatever it is, maybe fear, and say, yes, I think it's four. And you say, Johnny, you did a great job. Because you took those two apples, you put two together, you said one, two, three, four, and that's exactly what it is. You hit it on the nail. It's four. Great job, Johnny. You did a wonderful job thinking through this. Right? That's developmental. I know that's kind of a a long analogy of a simple thing. But listen, that's what education means. To draw out from within. You aduco the other person. You draw it out from within. So listen, if you do all the thinking, all the work, and all the problem solving, you're not developing. You're just dictating. You're just directing. So to help draw out the potential, you, you've got to aduco people. I mean, you've got to take on the challenge and slow down. Now, listen, it's a lot faster and easier to direct people. Just, hey, do this, do this, you do that, you do that, you do this, you do this. Got to go. Here we go. Let's go. Right? It's fast to do that. And it may be quick on the front end, but it will slow you down on the back end because you're not developing people. So it's slower on the front end, but you will expedite your influence and your impact on the back end if you start to lead with questions. Remember the old statement that says, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. 
right? I mean, only a leader could say that. I mean, that is a, a duco statement. That is such a great, powerful line. I mean, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to do it, you feed him for a lifetime. If you give someone the answer, you may feed them for the day, for the moment. But if you teach them how to come up with the answer, then you've fed them for a lifetime of leadership. I'm telling you, it, it is a big deal, this leading with questions. So I just want to give you two models and kind of unpack these and, and, and kind of bring this home. So model number one is the traditional way of leading that is the wrong way, to be honest. But it's the way that we grow up, and that's the leading with answers. And typically how this works is you have a leader in the front of the room or a leader that's kind of elevated above everybody else, and you have all the followers or the team are right there. And in this model, the, the answers go down, okay? So answers go down and questions are supposed to come up. So the leader says, here, here's what we're going to be doing on this project. Uh, we're going to be doing X, Y, and Z, and we need to get it done by this date, and we need to have it here. Uh, Jim, I want you to do this. Sally, I want you to make it here, and I want you to do this over here, and I want you to do that. Now, is there any questions? And at this point in this example, the team is supposed to come up with a bunch of questions. And say, uh, uh, yeah, sir, uh, ma'am, how, how did you want that? Or did, when you said that deadline, are you wanting it this way? Uh, how do you want the graphics to look? What, what do you want the marketing? What's your expectation there? Uh, what's your vision for this? Right. And so, again, it's answers are going down to the team and questions are supposed to flow up to the leader. That is the limiting view of most leadership and traditional leadership that is not effective. And it limits you and those around you. That's directing rather than developing. Answers go down. Questions are supposed to come up. I'm going to flip the model for you and tell you how leading actually works in its most effective form. And that's when you lead with questions. So questions go down and answers are supposed to come up from the team. Now, this is a whole different model because the leader is still the leader. They're still the boss or the person in charge or whatever it may be, and they're, they're there. But with the team, what happens is when, when the meeting starts or whatever it is, the leader starts off with questions and he looks at the team and says, Jim, where are we at with project so-and-so? What do you think can be done uh, by a certain deadline? Why do you think it can be done by that deadline? What is it that could be holding you back? What are some obstacles that we may see that might hold you or limit you from being able to get that done? Who do you need to work with? Who do you need to connect with in order to make that happen? What is your vision for the project? What is it that you think we can do if we push this thing to the max output? What is it that you think we can get done with the team? See how questions are going down in this kind of example? And then the answers are supposed to come up. So Jim or Sally or whoever it is is supposed to then begin to return with answers. I mean, engage them, get them thinking. I mean, get them to submit back to you as the leader what it is that they're committing to. Listen, people are way more accountable and committed to the things they came up with than things that you gave them to do. I mean, I, it's way more accountable for me to say, I'm going to get this done by uh, you know this date than it is just for you to tell me a date as a leader and say, get it done by then. You run the risk, if you just give people deadlines, you run the risk of them saying, well, I didn't think it was clear, or, you know, I ran into obstacles, and that wasn't realistic anyway. You, you know, that was just too hard of a, of a deadline. But when you engage people and you get them to come up with a deadline and you push them and drive them, and they commit to it, they say, well, I think I can get it done by this day. And you say, okay, do you think you can get it done sooner? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure. Well, what would you have to do to push yourself to do that? Right, And then they come up with the date. They're way more accountable to it because they committed to it. They're the ones that told you. And to be honest, as a leader, it's way easier to hold somebody accountable to things that they committed to do than things that you told them to do. Right, People just feel a, a, a greater weight. They feel more responsibility because they came up with it. That's the power of leading with questions. So questions go down from you as the leader, and they should come up from the team and the people around you. If you'll flip this model, and, and if you'll get away from leading with answers, and, and, and answers going down and questions are coming up, if you'll flip that and say, nope, questions are going to go down, Answers will come up from the team. If you'll start operating that way with your team, I'm telling you, you are going to develop your team. And it's, it's, it's not easy. I mean, this is, um, it, it can be frustrating. Listen, it's not easy to continue to ask questions. It's not easy to do this. But if you're going to be committed to it, 
You've got to focus on this and you've got to put forth the time. Sometimes you've got to stick with the question again and again. You know, Taichi Ono, who uh, was, was um, responsible for the whole Toyota production system, I mean, you know, phenomenal guy and, you know, Six Sigma and some of these things I think kind of came out as a result of this. But uh, Taichi Ono uh, was famous for um, creating this thing called the Five Whys. And you probably heard something similar of it. But basically he said that if you want to get to the root of a problem, you've got to dig down about five layers of asking why before you get to the root. Because the first three, four layers are more surface. They're more kind of symptoms of the problem. I had a client, you know, years ago that we worked with and, 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 and it went something like this. Um, he was late always coming to work. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, I said, okay, well, why are you always late? He said, well, so that was the first question. Why? Well, I always slept I, or I always sleep in and I oversleep on my alarm because I'm so tired and all that. Now, we could have said, okay, well, solution, um, you know, stop, you know, sleeping in and go to bed earlier or something like that. Um, but that would have been a surface answer. But we kept digging in. Well, why is it that you always oversleep? Well, I'm going to bed really late at night and I'm really not getting enough sleep. Okay. Well, hey, you need to get more sleep. Make sure that you get discipline to do it. But we're still not at the root problem. We got to keep asking why. So we go to the third why. Well, why are you staying up so late? Well, because I'm taking a lot of my work home during the day and I don't have enough time to get it done. So I, I bring it home and I'm working on it until the wee hours of the night and I just don't get enough sleep. So see, now we're starting to kind of get somewhere. Now we're hitting a little bit of uh, some oil, maybe a little bit there, right? As we dig into these five whys. But we're still not at the root problem. We could say, well, let's try to be more diligent at work, but we're not going to help solve the issue. No amount, or, uh, amount of being more disciplined is going to help this person until we get to the root. So we say, well, why are you bringing your work home? Why are you not getting it done during the day? Well, there's so many distractions and, uh, you know, at work, there's all these people popping in my office and uh, all these things that are coming on and people are ad hoc meetings and this and all that, and I'm just not able to get it done. So again, we could say, well, try to eliminate your distractions and all that, but let's get practical here. Well, what can you do to eliminate that? And to make a long story short, once we kind of got down to the fifth why, we realized that where this person's office was, their desk, it was right in the middle of this crossfire between all these different departments, and they always got brought into different issues that they really shouldn't have been a part of. It was kind of, you know, uh, distracting them and wasting their time uh, because they were right in the crosshairs of all this stuff going on. And listen, here's the simple fix. We moved the person's desk to another area in the office. And it changed everything about his ability to get more work done without being distracted. So listen, I mean, I'm telling you, it took us five whys before we got to the root problem of it was a desk placement issue. Not a matter of him being more disciplined to get up in the morning or set more alarms or turn them up louder, set three alarms and put them on the other side of the room. No amount of that probably would have helped solve the root problem. So to Tai Chi Ono's point of you got to dig into the five whys before you get to the root problem and that's what you've got to fix don't spend your time on the symptoms spend your time on the root and see how do you ever get to the root unless you ask why again leading with questions you've got to keep drilling down so listen this is not easy stuff as a leader this is hard because you've got to stick with the problem you've got to stay with it sometimes and you know, it, it, it's a lot faster, like I said earlier, just to kind of move on, you know, give somebody the answer. Well, listen, uh, move your alarm clock uh, across the room and t put three of them out there and make them louder. Come on, do something, get disciplined and get in the work on time. That wouldn't have helped solve the person's problem. In fact, they probably would have kept just feeling like a loser because they would have still kept sleeping in somehow. Or even if they got up, they would have been dead tired because they're still staying up late. You get the point. Leading with questions is powerful and it makes a massive difference in your ability to connect with others. So if you're going to be a great leader, whatever that means in your organization, listen, if you're going to be a great leader in your home, if you're going to be a great leader in your community, wherever it may be, you've got to lead with questions. And when you start utilizing this, it will revolutionize your ability to develop people around you. And it will take the pressure off of you as a leader, having to have all the answers, always being dependent upon you being present and creating a codependent relationship with you and your team or those around you. So lead with 
questions. I'm telling you, it's powerful. I wrote about this in my book, Leadology, 12 Ideas to Level Up Your Leadership. Uh, I kind of break this down and that. That's where this kind of comes from. But um, I want to encourage you, lead with questions. Guys, it's so great to connect with you. Remember, download the Leader Guide each month when we listen to this podcast and um, leave a review. Let us know that it's adding value to you somehow, some way. And uh, listen, I want to help level you up so you don't level out in your influence and your impact. Listen, you guys are awesome. Have a great time leading with questions. Start practicing it now so that you can get great down the line. We'll see you next time, guys. Thanks for listening to the John Barrett Leadership Podcast. To get more of John's resources, visit www.johnbarrettleadership.com.